Good to see you. Welcome, everybody. Give us just a few minutes to let some folks in and make sure that we will start promptly after that. We'll give two minutes and then we will begin our evening program. We're so glad that you're here. Can I get the meeting passcode? I'm trying to get on my computer, not my phone. Just one second. Elizabeth, do you have that? Let me see if I can get it for you, just a second. Yeah, I don't have it because I'm logged in on our account as the host, and so I didn't have a meeting ID, but hold on one second. Okay. Our, our IT right. person is in the background. Try, are you ready? Yes. Try 045611. Okay, looks like it's working. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. And my name is Yvonne Brandon. I'm chair of Public Schools First NC. We're a public education advocacy group that works across the state to advocate for strong public schools. And one of the things that we care deeply about is making sure that our schools have those strong um, specialized uh, support staff that is that is needed to make sure that our children are getting the services they need in their school in their schools and also as resources to our faculty our staff our principals and one such area are our school uh, psychologists we have several with us tonight and we've invited them here to talk about something that's really important to all of us and that's why you're here and thank you all for coming and that is special education and um, so I want to jump right into our program tonight, and I want to introduce to you um, three of our um, wonderful presenters tonight. Um, I think, uh, Lee, that everybody probably in education across the state and certainly in Wake County knows um, Lee. Uh, she is not only a school psychologist, but she is an advocate for children. Um, uh, in all areas of their studies academically. She's a nationally certified school psychologist. Um, she has a background in elementary and, and middle school. She's worked in both areas. She um, special does a lot of early intervention and experience working in public schools at the, uh, as I said, in both areas. At the state level, Lee has been active in an organization that's been very powerful in the past few years, the North Carolina School Psychology Association. And she has served in a leadership role there for the last decade almost. And she's been chair of their public policy committee, which has done amazing work uh, in the General Assembly. Um, in 2019, she was awarded the National School Psychologist of the Year Award by the National Association of School Psychologists. Quite quite a, an honor after receiving the School Psychology of the Year Award in Wake County. And we're, we're, we're very, very proud of her. Um, we also have joining her tonight, Michael Thomas, who's an administrator of, of an exceptional children's program. Um, also um, self-named himself as Lee did as an advocate, which I think is a powerful statement. Uh, Michael graduated with a specialist degree in school psychology from Winthrop University and has his postmaster certificate of school administration from UNCG. He has worked as a school psychologist in both North Carolina and South Carolina, prior to serving as the coordinator for EC and AIG services in Chatham County. He was the lead psychologist in Albemarle, Albemarle Burlington school system. He has spent the majority of his career specializing in the implementation of the RTL and the MTSS. Um, additionally, he has had the opportunity to work at DPI at the state level with other colleagues on training LEAs on implementing RTL, as well as the old 2020 SLD policy. Last presenter tonight is Angela Abernathy. I just love this photo she sent in of her family. She is a mother and an advocate, and she has some really wonderful um, information to share with us tonight and that role that she plays. Um, she is a mother of three. Her eldest child does have Down syndrome diagnostic, diagnostic. 
and she um, has spent a lot of time working in her son, her daughter's school and with all her children. Uh, she was born in Durham, North Carolina. She's close by. She was raised in Raleigh. Her secondary educational experience spans both the independent and public school systems in Wake County. She has an undergraduate degree from UNCW, and she's currently not only a full-time employee, but as we've said, a mother, a wife, and a, an incredible advocate for all children. And so with that, I want to, that quick introduction, I think you're gonna to get to know, really enjoy these three experts in this area. And I'm gonna turn it over to Lee to kind of give us a, a overlay of what we're hoping to accomplish tonight. Lee, thank you. And Angela and Ma Michael, thank you for being here. For everybody else, one quick reminder, if you don't mind muting yourself, it would really help our presenters. And then when we're done with the presentation tonight, we're gonna to have plenty of time for questions and your thoughts. So thank you, Aunt Lee. Thank you. Um, just uh, one quick correction that it was, it's not RTL, it's RTI, which was responsiveness to um, instruction, responsiveness to intervention. So I, I know that some people might have had a little question about that, but. Um, I just want to say welcome to this webinar and thank you all for reserving your time tonight to join in advocacy that we hope will support students with disabilities. Um, our panel is just obviously a small group of people who support increased access for students with disabilities in our community across North Carolina. And we really want to continue conversations that have long been occurring. Um, we are really happy to be here tonight. We hope to continue conversations and thinking to support students with disabilities, as well as hopefully open up some new conversations to advocate on behalf of students with disabilities going forward. I proudly work in the public school system and I support students with disabilities on a daily basis in a variety of ways as a school psychologist. Um, every one of my days is different and, and it really is, every day is different. And every day I do um, support um, or spend time with a student with disabilities or their teacher in some way. Our panel is representative of school psychology, of parents of, of a parent of student with disabilities and of special education administrators. Um, we acknowledge that we don't have all the answers um, and we don't have all the information out there because we, we can't have all that information. Um, but we do, however, um, we know, we do know, however, that uh, people who work in schools with students with disabilities and their families are experiencing a variety of situations across the state. And as we move through our webinar, um, we will propose some positive solutions. Um, we'll share information that is available from different sources. And we just um, mostly want to have a conversation tonight. Our proposed outcomes are listed and the compelling why for advocacy is that students with disabilities rely on those who are able and willing to advocate on their behalf. They rely on those among us who have the influence and the stamina to propose solutions and to move the needle for change. And they rely on those who care deeply about them. We will review some data for students with disabilities and then we're gonna discuss the challenges facing them from a wide, pretty wide lens. And finally, we're gonna move into talking about the resources, the supports, and the, excuse me, the proposed positive solutions and access points. And um, with these words, uh, let's uh, move to the next slide. Okay. North Carolina and all states, as we know, provide special education services to students from age three through 22 or high school graduation in public schools. And there are 14 areas or disabilities by which a child may qualify for special education services. Special education is provided in charter schools. Our children, our students are the main stakeholders in special education. And throughout this presentation, our slides use the acronym SWD when referring to students with disabilities. We hope this presentation will be a conversation and will spark further conversations. And again, we fully acknowledge that, that we're not gonna have all the answers to the questions, 
um, that you might have. Um, hopefully we have answers to most of the questions. Um, we do, however, have a commitment to supporting students with disabilities and enriching their lives through public education and beyond. Next slide, please. Um, data. Uh, anybody that works in schools knows that um, data is uh, something that we look at daily. And um, data is a really important part of every conversation in the field of education. And this is a breakdown of just some basic information about special education in North Carolina. And I just, I like to look at these numbers myself as a reminder. Um, and we have included the number of children being provided special education um, several times during this presentation because it bears repeating of how many children we are advocating for. The prevalence of the top six disabling conditions are listed, um, learning disabled, speech impaired, developmentally delayed includes, um, and that includes ages three until age eight, autism, intellectually disabled, mild, and other health impaired. And um, there are um, currently a total of 195,381 students, um, total children in North Carolina, including pre-K, receiving special education. And that um, information was current as of uh, December 1st, uh, 2021. And then uh, 17,316 students is the total um, children in North Carolina ages three, four, and five, not in kindergarten, in pre-K. Um, and the uh, pre-K prevalence is autism, developmentally delayed, and speech impaired. And so for those interested in seeing a breakdown of this information, um, the source of the information is included, and this is public information for viewing. Um, schools have federal headcount in December of each year and a state headcount every year on April 1st and having an accurate accounting of the number of children eligible to receive special education. Special education is tied to funding and our schools um, right now are working so diligently to have meetings um, for the April 1st headcount. All right, next slide, please. Um, I probably don't have to repeat this, but advocacy is essential. There, um, Every day, every year, uh, we have to advocate. It is essential for many reasons. And um, obviously these are not all the reasons, but we know that uh, students with disabilities need more and different resources in schools and that their needs change over time as they move from pre-K to adulthood. We'll talk about the advocacy around uh, workforce shortages affecting schools across our nation and the impact shortages are having on students with disabilities and on schools. The supports that um, would ideally be readily available at every school are stretched. Um, I think we've seen that in the news. Um, I see that every day in my schools um, and, and we are all feeling it. And I know families are feeling it and know students are feeling it. Um, and advocacy is essential for change and improvement. Each of us has a role to play and our panel echoes that continued support for the Leandro recommendations to be put into action with recurring and sustain sustainable funding um, is, is important. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm gonna pass uh, this next section over to um, my friend and colleague, Michael Thomas. Next slide, please. Thanks, Lee. <clears throat> okay, so let's just kind of go over some of the uh, impacts of the pandemic uh, on students with disabilities and really all, all students um, through the pandemic. But learning loss um, obviously is, uh, was an issue and continues to be an issue recovering from uh, learning loss. DPI published a, published a report uh, March 2nd that went over their findings. Uh, so I encourage you to look that up if you have any specific details uh, or having specific questions about the details in that report. Um, so the, there's also a loss of opportunities, not just in academic, social, emotional engagement, um, engagement with one another as students, but also with adults, um, the loss of routines or having to learn new routines and adjust back to um, in-person school routines. So it was an uh, impact with service delivery. Uh, in-person services were certainly uh, very difficult and complicated. So there was an increase in uh, remote therapy, which has limitations. 
uh, remote instruction. Families and schools had to adjust, and I think are, are still adjusting to just a ton of information, you know, new legislation, new, new relief packages, new ways of learning, new ways of teaching, uh, changes at the last minute, not knowing what to expect, new changes or changes to the schedule from day to day. It was obviously, it was a very complex time that we all went through adjusting and now adjusting back. So just, but all that adds to the stress uh, in particular um, for students with, with disabilities and, and for families of students with disabilities. So teachers have been and continue to be differentiating instruction. I think we've learned that there are limitations to how much you can differentiate, um, specifically when, we're, when we were remote. Um, now that we're coming back in, I do think that a lot of the a lot of what we've learned about differentiation and, and some of the, the new tools and the innovations that we have been able to acquire during that time is helping and will continue to be um, a helpful tool as we move forward. Um, concern and care for students with disabilities who have compromised immune systems, that continues to be an issue. There continues to be families who are concerned about bringing their students back into the school environment now that you know we're, they're mixed opinions about mask mandates and the removal of the mandates and, and families who have um, varying levels of concerns for their students, that continues to be an added stressor and school systems trying to find appropriate solutions to, um, to meet their needs. So those are all relevant current impacts, just to sort of set that scene. Next slide. Next, next slide. There we go, thanks. Okay, so NC Papa put out a statement through at NC uh, on October 21st. We're, we're all, they specifically, but really all of us are recognizing that staffing shortages are the number one issue facing principals and other school leaders. We're having a, uh, we'll talk more about that as we go through, but having significant difficulty finding teachers, retaining teachers. There's so many different issues impacting education historically, but also the impacts of the pandemic have compounded those and led to significant shortages in some instances of um, educators. And that is, that is clearly one of the number one issues that we're facing. Next slide. So over 2,600 teacher vacancies reported in the state with high school, STEM, and exceptional children positions being hardest to fill. So it tried to shore up some of those vacancies um, with a residency permit to teach, emergency licensed um, personnel try to make up for some of those shortages. So this quote, more than ever, we need our policy makers uh, and budget writers to recognize the severity and the root causes of the unprecedented staffing shortages plaguing our schools and take all necessary steps to provide competitive salaries, benefits, and working conditions that will give our school leaders the leverage they must have to attract the kind of workforce our students need and deserve. So leverage is an important word there. Um, I, you know, some of these issues that have been facing education have been facing education for a while, and, and the pandemic has highlighted some of those issues, but one of the things clearly that has, has um, I think, revealed itself is that uh, increasingly, as people graduate from, from colleges, universities, they want flexible and creative work environments, and um, years and years of budget cuts and, and just the, the overall workload in education make, sometimes make that more complicated. So giving it principals and, and education leaders leverage to really bring folks in, um, the freedom to look at some creative solutions for holding staff, for attracting staff, I think that's really important. I mean, I, I wanna get into what specifically those might be, um, but the, I think just a, a mind shift to thinking more openly about what can we do to attract and, and maintain um, a workforce. Next. Angela, I think that. Okay. okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so showing here are some school-based supports that are available to um, students in the public school system. Um, these are, these are, have been essential um, people and invaluable to us as my child has gone through and entered the, um, the education system in Wake County. Um, special education teachers obviously are the, the primary point of contact um, for any special um, education child or a child with a disability. School psychologists, um, speech therapists. Next slide, please. 
occupational therapist, physical therapist, um, adapted PE teachers and intervention teachers. We've experienced uh, an array of these specialists along the way. And one of the biggest priorities that we've come away with um, so far in the, in the school system is the communication. Um, all of these and all of these employees are going to be a part of an IEP team. Um, it is super important and very relevant for them to communicate with each other as well as with the parent of the child. Um, without that communication, it makes it really hard to um, to determine what um, what the needs of the child will be as they progress forward through their school schooling. Next slide. And I'm handing this back to Lee. Okay. All right. All right. So we are, let's see where we are here. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit. Um, we're going to put, again, we're going to put some data out there. Um, and I tried to be as specific as possible because I appreciate that when people do that with me and I wanna get as updated information. This is pretty updated information because this is from the beginning of the month, March 2nd. Um, this is um, information that is a very recent data provided by the um, State Board of Ed. And we have a breakdown of the total number of teachers and more information to show the depth of our educator pipeline issues in North Carolina. Um, I know that this is not new information. Um, I, I personally and professionally like to um, see what, what the numbers are. Um, and you can see that this report is um, very recent. There are a total of 94,328 teachers employed in our public schools. Um, about 8.2% of North Carolina teachers or 7,735 left during the 20, 000, excuse me, 2020 21 school year, it's a mouthful to say, <laughs> per the State Board of Education. Um, and the um, State Board of Education puts this report out annually. Um, there, are, there were 2,106 teachers who retired and 600 more teachers left teaching jobs in North Carolina in the 12 month span than did the previous school year. Okay, next slide, please. If you, um, for those who are interested in seeing this information uh, and learning more about the workforce shortages in education, we have included a link to the document that will provide that. Um, the big picture in North Carolina is that fewer people are entering the teaching workforce. And there has been a continual decline in the number of teachers coming out of educator prep programs for several years. Um, I was trying to get some, um, some numbers around that, but I will say honestly, the document was quite large and um, I did not have time to do that. But um, always a great opportunity. Um, if you're very interested in this topic um, to see like how, how it looks from one educator prep program to another, um, you can go to the DPI website and that, that is also public information, but um, schools are chronically understaffed and many educators are leaving the profession in our state. Um, thus, we have a pipeline issue for staffing our schools with highly trained educators. Um, that impacts all students, but it um, just especially and so much more impacts our students who receive special education. And um, I know, uh, I think Angela, I actually, I think Angela, I may have taken this slide in a, unintentionally from you. Um, do you want to talk about this from a parent standpoint? Because I know this is so near and dear to you. Um, sure, um, I'm happy to add. I, you know, I I did mention, you know, to both Lee and Michael um, prior to this session that being a full time employee myself, I think, um, especially since the pandemic, recruitment of uh, and hiring has been a challenge for just about everybody across the board. Um, and I th I think especially particularly in the education system. Um, it's, it's, it's been 
both a challenge and a concern because we really have to, I mean, you're taking on an extraordinary responsibility, right, with our kids. And how do we, how do we strike up the interest um, for, for motivating um, our young, our young people coming out of college to take on this responsibility, to take on this role and to stay with it. Um, it's really, it's, it's really important. I think now more than ever to kind of evaluate uh, where we are um, socially, um, what our dependencies are, what motivates people, what, what, and, and it goes beyond just the monetary um, aspect of it. Of course, that's very, very important, but um, you know, I think everyone is especially looking at how to drive and recruit people um, and thinking outside of the box that they've that they've never really had to do before. Um, and and so I I wish that I could I could really give really great examples of how we could maybe do that with um, the education system. Um, I know that um, in some counties across the state, especially rural counties, um, the, the school system has um, partnered up with an organization, whether it's nonprofit or if it's a corporation, to try to help maybe establish um, housing uh, for young adults who are coming into the profession to kind of appeal to them in some way to come and stay um, in, a, in a rural area that doesn't have maybe a lot to offer um, that like a bigger metropolitan city would have. So I, I don't know the answer, but um, I do know that creative thinking is probably um, something that would need to start to be incorporated in this process. Next slide. All right, so uh, I think Michael and I are gonna both kind of just tag team on this. Um, Michael, do you want me to get us started on this one? Sure. Yeah, no worries, that's fine. Um, how did we get here? Because we didn't get in, we, the workforce shortages have, um, you know, they've gotten worse over time and we actually do know quite a few reasons why it has gotten to this point. Um, and we've included some of these reasons um, for how we now find our schools um, working during significant workforce shortages. Um, number one reason is a decade of budget cuts. Um, just have to put that one up front that, uh, you know, North Carolina budget cuts in state funding in education for the last decade have really stymied and stretched districts thin for allocating positions and funding schools. Um, you know, it's just, it's been a whole lot of cuts one after another. Um, we, North Carolina does not have a statewide, our statewide, we have a non-competitive pay scale. Our teacher pay scale is non-competitive for recruitment and retention. We have all sorts of data around that. I mean, I think I did not include um, data sources in here, but fair to say at this point in time, you can Google it and find out the information from um, multiple sources. Pay differs by district across the state and that impacts rural districts quite a bit. Um, Michael, you wanna take that, you wanna take that last one? You wanna take the next slide? How, sure. how she, yeah. yeah, we can, we'll just keep tag team here. Um, okay. So one of the things I can speak to from a more of an administrative perspective um, is that this, this bit about increased workload in schools paired with increased opportunities um, and competitive pay outside of the school system has led to resignations. One of the real ways that that kind of hits home is, is there um, a number of the different related services have licensures that allow them to work in clinics and hospitals and settings outside of the school. And so one of the challenges that we face in public education is losing speech pathologists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, folks like that to, um, private practice to um, hospitals, to clinics, to uh, contract agencies that that propose to provide greater flexibility, things like that. So that's a real challenge um, for, for public school systems. Um, so, you know, no easy answers, but I, I, I think just it's good to have an awareness that 
that is one of the issues. Psychologists can do that with certain licensure. They can also have some flexibility to work privately or work outside of the school system. Um, but it's, it, it, is, it is something that we're uh, forced to uh, work with. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, along those same lines, just the workload for special education teachers is, is a, uh, was, was already pretty high um, in terms of just the, uh, the amount of paperwork, documentation, um, the number of meetings, um, things like that. Um, it, it, special education, as you know, is a, is a very complex field. Um, every student has their own unique needs. Um, every family is its own, um, has its own needs and, and requirements. So partnering with families to support students is, is obviously it's, it's complex and it's unique, unique. And so we should spend every, you know, all the time that we have to spend supporting families and students, we should do that. Um, but as the staff thins out and as we continue to have, uh, uh, a large burden of paperwork and things like that. It it's just becomes you know it's it's a lot, and so I, that's where I think grace on both sides, um, where you know we need to as as educators recognize the challenges that families face with getting off of work, you know being available at times because our limit our availability in education sometimes is limited, um, and so it's hard on families obviously to come in at certain times, and vice versa. So I think just partnering with one another, communicating there, uh, having lots of grace with one another there is, is helpful. Okay, next slide. Okay, I think that one's mine. Um, just more um, uh, statewide shortages, specifically for support staff related service providers. Um, and that's me. So with the ongoing shortages of uh, support staff, school psychologists, speech therapists, and occupational therapists, these are, you know, staff that I work um, very closely with on a daily basis. And um, I'm, I know if you've been on other webinars, um, we, school, North Carolina School Psychology Association has spoken several times um, about our statewide shortages. Um, that are ongoing, and there are. Uh, I think. I think the last. Um, the last data point that I had is that there are currently, twenty five school districts. That may be a little bit more, a little bit less, since I, um, knew that data point. But there's about twenty five school districts in North Carolina that, that where students have no access to a school to a full time school psychologist, and that. Um, that means, uh, you know, less time for direct support. Um, it also affects the teaming structure so that the teams in school are, are super important um, for collaboration and for problem solving around what's going on with students. It requires um, a teaming approach to address these complex issues um, so that we, we can make sure that these kids are growing in school. I know, um, Angela, did you want to talk any more about this? Um, talk about it just from a from a parent standpoint, you know, some of the realities of vacancies with special education teachers. Um, sure, sure. Um, I, I've been quite fortunate myself uh, with our daughter who um, has, had a, has, a, has had a team intact um, since she started kindergarten. Um, but we have certainly experienced scenarios prior to, she has been in the Wake County public school system since she was three, so since pre-K, um, where there, there weren't necessarily um, um, members of the team who could be present all of the time. And that, and, and as I mentioned before, the communication isn't there when there isn't um, an available resource to communicate with. Um, also, it's just, a necessity for consistency. Um, you know, special education kids really require consistency. All kids require consistency, but these kids really require consistency. And when they do not receive um, consistent uh, personnel or attention or the communication um, is missing, then there, there seems to be um, a little bit that goes awry uh, on occasion, and and that can make that can make a, schooling on a weekly basis quite challenging for a parent. Okay, gonna, should we go to the next slide? 
So um, impact of workforce shortages um, and budget cuts. Um, our, our state budget is hampering how schools can provide services. We're paying the price for um, sometimes litigation surrounding um, free and appropriate education with the challenges we're being faced and students and families are operating with under-resourced um, systems and, and no one wants that. The school systems obviously do not want that. I can safely say that no family wants that. Um, and so it is just, um, it's really a conundrum right now. Um, and there are just so many factors that school districts have uh, really no or limited control over. Um, and, you know, again, uh, budget cuts for more than a decade have just exacerbated our state's ability to recruit and retain educators. And this really um, impacts schools' ability to provide the very best quality of services to students with disabilities. And families are concerned um, about this. Um, and, and I am, and we, and, and educators are. Um, and so um, I really, you know, I, I can't say enough about that. Um, we're gonna talk um, just another few minutes about, um, you know, the, land, the landmark Leandro ruling um, and our constitutional duty for all students to have the opportunity to receive a sound basic education. So if we wanna go to um, the next slide, I'm super, um, ready to talk about supportive solutions versus the blaming and shaming of educators. Um, I, I feel very strongly about this, um, that there are, as we know, many supportive solutions. And these are not new solutions and, and have been proposed by many over many years. Um, and these are uh, increased, obviously, increased advocacy efforts, what we're doing right here, um, specifically around Leandro, that is more recent. Um, that lead to recurring and sustainable funding streams for students with disabilities. Um, another one is increased advocacy for pay scales that support the recruitment and retention of highly qualified special education teachers and support staff. And increased and targeted professional learning and understanding for school staff of multi-tiered systems of support and evidence-based interventions because um, we have so much information to show what works in schools. We have a huge um, amount of information around that. Um, but the increased, um, I just wanna back up just a little bit because we have Michael on here and he actually is an expert <laughs> in talking about um, RTI and MTSS. So do you want to talk, can you, can you talk a little bit about that, Michael? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I it, it's always, early identification of, of risk and early intervention is always really, really important. So the more we can do to train educators on systems and structures that work to identify students who are at risk for failure or experiencing disabilities and to intervene and do whatever we can to try and, and make sure that we can provide services in the most, or excuse me, the least restrictive environment as possible for as long as possible, then we should do that. Um, so it's MTSS right now is, is in North Carolina, it's how we structure um, it really the education system, you know, multiple tiers of support, systems of support. Um, so I, I, there are folks coming in from other states, which is fine. I mean, it's welcome to come and work and in our schools, people are coming out of uh, undergraduate, graduate programs that varying levels of, of training on MTSS. North Carolina does have a very good um, structure in place from DPI to, to train folks on MTSS, but school districts can also support that uh, internally uh, to make sure that the school administration, school staff, uh, and families have access to that information and that we do uh, focus our efforts on and our, and our monies on evidence-based intervention um, so that we have the, the, the greatest chance possible of, of supporting students. So yeah, I, I mean, that's just kind of a, we really, the other thing is that it is in the MTSS world, we really talk a lot about aligning existing resources and when budgets are low and, and needs are high, that's a great time to focus on taking what you do have and aligning it so that uh, everybody's on the same page so that uh, we can quickly know who's at risk and who's, who's in need of um, uh, 
um, not just intervention, but who needs it, who's, who's ready to grow even farther, who needs enrichment. Uh, we need systems that help us do that. And we do, we just need to continue to support them. So that is a really strong um, solution right now, is to just get behind structures like MTSS and evidence-based interventions, make sure families understand the, uh, the language um, and that we're talking to one another about it. Okay. And I think the next slide is Angela, if you wanna, do you wanna take that one? Sure, um, so, Additional supportive solutions, um, quarterly district homeschool connections between district leaderships and families to check in to get updates, um, accountability for IEPs. And I think I've mentioned this a couple of times already, it includes the collaboration and the communication. Communication is just such a key word there. It's, when it's missing, um, when the communication is missing, I have um, experienced some struggle um, both on my end and um, from the administrative side and from the um, teaching professional side. Um, you know, it, it just, it makes things much more complicated. Um, and then increased accountability, accountability for outcome measure for students with disabilities specifically in the area of reading um, and increased growth in the child's school career. Okay. Next slide. Um, okay, so I think the, uh, we just have a few more here. Um, we've got, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier, teaming, structure, teaming structures should be supported in schools for access to um, related service providers. Um, I routinely have parent consultations as I said before, I routinely um, have uh, team time with um, other related service providers at my school. Um, definitely increase pre-K funding for early identification and intervention that promotes long-term benefits. Another one is interventions that support students in the least restrictive settings and increase inclusion with peers. And also access to behavioral health resources pre-K through 12th grade um, support long-term benefits. We know that research supports it. Um, I dare say there's any school in the state at this point in time that hasn't embraced social emotional learning and behavioral health um, strategies. Uh, it's embedded in core in most schools at this point in time. And um, I hope it just doesn't ever go away because it's um, so beneficial. Um, next slide, please. Michael, I think you're going to take this one and talk about at the state level, some supportive solutions. Right. Yeah. So, and, you know, these are just kind of thinking out loud about things that we can all advocate for. Um, I, so thinking about administrator training in particular, um, I, it would be helpful for all of us to, to advocate for um, inclusion of these things, really focusing on these things in administrator training programs, whether it be special education, whether it be school, you know, principalships, whatever, there are various different types of administrative programs, but really having good, um, a really good focus on evidence-based instruction so they know what to look for. As an administrator, again, whether you're special education, whether it's a principal, whatever it is, making sure that administrators know what to look for. Um, MTSS training, making sure they understand clearly what models are in place in North Carolina, how to support them, what questions to ask when they become administrators, um, just empowering them to lead schools that are endeavoring to, to implement MTSS programming. Trauma-informed care and instruction, really at the, and honestly, I would say it's not just administrators, it's also just you know, educators in general. It, when teachers come out of their teacher prep programs, one of the things that sometimes we see is they've, they've had varying levels of support in learning how to think about and support students who've experienced trauma. Being able to think about, you know, hey, with fight, flight, or freeze, uh, is, it, is this student who's acting out experiencing fight, flight, or, fight, flight, or freeze, or is it something they're actively choosing to in, in, engage in this particular behavior? And if, if they haven't had the right kind of training on that, it can be difficult um, to, to um, help teachers think through um, supporting those students who have experienced trauma. So focusing intentionally on that, 
um, would be helpful. Increasing data literacy so that uh, administrators and teachers know how to speak the language of data um, to, to one another, to families, how to have their own understanding of the various types of data. Um, it is part of teacher training programs, it is part of administrative programs, but it never hurts to, to continue to bolster those efforts. Um, incre increased inclusion and, and equity. So, you know, when I went to, when I got my administrative uh, degree at UNCG, that was a, a major area of focus was was inclusion and equity and thinking about how to um, concretely implement those things. So that, that's a really helpful and powerful tool to have um, in your education. And I think the more we can support that for teachers and administrators across the state, the better. So we can continue to advocate for those things. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is another um, important solution here, accommodating parent caregiver engagement um, and involvement at all levels. So I've worked in um, cities, I've worked in rural areas, medium-sized districts, small districts with uh, families with all different income levels. And there are challenges uh, and there, there are strengths and weaknesses in, 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 in all the different environments, but working together to make sure that we're doing what we can to make meeting times available to families if they can't be there, um, to look at, uh, to be intentional about Doing, using the technology that we've now learned how to use, Zoom and whatever we can to get fam families involved in meetings, sharing information in a timely manner, uh, making sure that families understand that they are important, they're critical, we want to share information with them, we want to get information from them, we have to partner with families in order to, to truly support um, students. So accommodating that I think is super important and something to continue to advocate for. Uh, authentically engaging students in their own learning. So do the students know what goals they have what, or what goals that the teachers have? Do the students work with the teachers to set those goals? Are they talking about where they are, are teachers and educators talking to students about their progress towards those goals? Super helpful to do that, very powerful um, if we can do that with students, in, you know, including students in their own conferences, helping students to lead their own conferences so they can take ownership in their own learning. Um, communication around data and MTSS structures and resources with families so the families know what resources are there um, to prevent um, potentially some disabilities, to uh, better support the students in, in any number of ways. Do the families know what interventions are available? Do they know what their rights are in terms of, um, you know, for special education rights? Do they know um, whether or not their student is receiving intervention, do they know what the student's goals are, what progress the student is making? Um, that's super important. Mm -hmm. um, child find special education rights. So making sure that families, we need to, as families ask for your rights and as educators give rights, what, what, what is child find? Uh, what, are, what are the rights that are associated with that? Um, and, and again, authentic partnership between schools, communities, and parents and care caregivers. So really, you know, it's, I don't think any of us has the perfect answer for any of these problems, but they're really trying to partner, even when there are communication barriers there, or, you know, if, if, if there's maybe some anger, frustration, whatever it is, really trying to partner, working through it, bringing in other people if we need to, to help us talk to one another, to help us work through to find solutions, but committing to work together to solve problems is, is super important. Um, so again, that open, authentic conversations about student progress and core curriculum. So we as educators um, can, and then I think this is a culture that could be taught and can, I mean, it is being taught, but continue to teach it in uh, teacher prep programs, administrative prep programs. This, this idea of having a culture and climate where we really want to be open about how are most students doing? Is the core instruction working? Um, how uh, is the intervention working? Are most students responding to intervention? Um, so when we talk about individual students who aren't responding to instruction and may need additional support, um, it's important to know whether or not the majority of other students were also responding or not responding. That's, it's important to have those open conversations. Um, okay, next slide. Could I, could I tack something on really quickly there, Michael? Oh, sure, yes, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to kind of add that we, we've been we've been the benefactor of having the support and the solutions put into place. And when we see and experience um, 
those su supportive measures transcend beyond our regular routine of school, home, school, home. When we um, try to be a little more flexible with our children, with our child, um, and we travel or we um, try out a camp or we try out a classroom and we see that what they've taken from a supportive narrative within the school system transcend beyond into those areas. We, it's really a beautiful thing. It's really, it, it makes us so, it gives us so much gratitude for those that have contributed to how our child is developing and growing. Right. Um, so I think, Michael, things. I think you've got, oh, go I think you've got the next slide with Esser. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we don't have to spend a whole long time here, but just know there are things that the, the government is doing to help and that are helpful. So, you know, the funds that have come from, from Esser have really helped schools um, kind of work through this. So the K-12 emergency relief fund, digital curricula options, Canvas learning management system, various tools and things that have come from this. Um, the innovative child uh, child care and remote extended support and eye cares. Um, let's see. So there's been additional support for specialized instructional support personnel through gear, through the, um, the, the, the money that comes from that um, and um, supplemental instructional services. So there's, the, the, I, I will, I mean, I need to give credit here. The funding that has come from this is super helpful for supporting schools um, to kind of shore up some of the unforeseen issues that you know nobody expected mm -hmm. us to go into. Pandemic. Yeah. I mean, it's it, no one knew how exactly it was going to affect us. So the, the things are being done that are helpful. Mm -hmm. So it's important to say that. Yeah, the gear funds. Next that slide. was a shot in the yeah. arm, especially for instructional, specialized instructional support personnel. Um, it was definitely good. Um, I think the next slide, it, Angela, you want to take the next slide for community resources? Uh Sure. Okay. Um, groups such as this one, Public Schools First NC, is a fantastic advocacy group. Um, Exceptional Children's Assistance Center, ARC of North Carolina, um, North, North Carolina Down Syndrome Alliance, um, Autism Society of North Carolina, Disability Rights of North Carolina, Family Support Network of North Carolina, Exceptional Children's Division, DPI, Disability Services, NCDHHS. Um, another one that's not on this list is the Triangle Down Syndrome um, Association. Um, and also um, I'm at the foundation level of a group called um, AFI, it's Advocates for Inclusive Education. Um, and that is a, a group being led by um, the former director of the TDSN, and um, we are in the process of figuring out what our mission is and how we can contribute um, the best we possibly can to, to the state of North Carolina. We're gonna, that's, that's a future webinar, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll get Carrie Albrook on it. That's, that's who's leading that charge. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take us into Leandro. Is that okay? Um, so this uh, this next slide. Uh, well, this the slide before. I'm sorry. I think we skipped the slide with the with the rowing team. But just to just to say that you know, parent and student voice is important. We are we are all rowing in the same direction. We we must all work together. Um, and and sometimes it's you know. Not the perfect picture, but we were, we're all trying. Um, uh, for Leandro, these are Leandro critical needs, and I have included both the West Ed um, document on there, as well as the, um, I think it's the executive summary from uh, the uh, governor's website. And this is the Commission on Access to Sound Basic Education. And I've listed out some things that are that I pulled out that I think are specific to um, this webinar, ensuring that the way effectiveness is measured in schools, general education and special education and early learning programs is useful and meaningful to the stakeholders. Um, obviously, we wanna engage people from low income communities and communities of color and parents of students with disabilities in the design, reporting, and fine-tuning of accountability measures. Um, 
providing comprehensive whole child supports, including professional staff, such as nurses, counselors, psychologists, and social workers, and connecting the data systems for the birth through age five programs to the data systems that are um, in public schools to support that vertical alignment and transitions. Next slide. And then the um, other two on here um, are just revising the state's school funding formula so that it, um, there is some flexibility in that and it includes students with the greatest needs and includes students with disabilities and disadvantaged students and at-risk students and students with limited English proficiency and um, developing and implementing a plan for including on the annual um, school report cards school level information on race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status and other democratic, excuse me, demographic information on all students, staff, um, and students identified for exceptional children's services um, and students participating in advanced learning opportunities and other um, information. So I, you know, I'm on the Leander Commission. I still go back to these documents um, and, and um, I was a part of those conversations. These were deep conversations. They were very thoughtful over a very long period of time. It is an excellent roadmap. Um, if you have not looked at this, I would, I, I, at this point in time, would just beg people to go on and read these documents. This is a good roadmap for our state. Um, it is inclusive um, of all the students that we serve. Uh, these are conversations and advocacy needed. I just put, we put on here future directions. Um, I encourage anyone on this call or anyone else that you know um, is interested in these topics, what are the existing access points for students with disabilities who are exiting public school systems? Um, Think College is a really good, um, uh, really good resource. Um, how are they accessing uh, continuing education? How are they accessing housing, medical care, and leisure recreation as they exit high school? Um, reading instruction outcomes for students with disabilities, um, super, super important, could be a webinar in and of itself. Proposed solutions to support streamline access points for children with, dis excuse me, people with disabilities and community resources and partnerships. Um, and then I think we're moving up against to the eight o'clock mark. So we'll go to the next slide. And then again, we have 195,252 uh, students with disabilities in North Carolina. And that's more people than the town of Cary. And I did look that up. <laughs> Less than, uh, more than Fayetteville or less than, less than Fayetteville, more than Cary. So um, I, I hope I speak on behalf of Angela and Michael and saying thank you for, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for taking time. And um, to anyone here, be brave, ask questions and um, keep speaking up for children because they need us and, and we need them. All right, Yvonne, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thank you all so very, very much. And, and now the best part of the program, other, other than the presentation, is to allow our audience to make some comments and share some thoughts or ask some questions. I think the one thing that came through very, very clear um, from these uh, parents, these advocates, these professionals, is that we do have some serious challenges in delivering special education services to our children with disabilities. And it is not just around staffing, it is around things such as the, the training necessary for everybody in the building that works with children. It is also around the funding formulas that does not really adequately fund the services at the level that children with disabilities need. So we have some serious issues here and a lot of children who need our help. We saw recently this, this week, another study come, that came out looking at the gaps, um, academic learning gaps between uh, the children had experienced over the last two years. And I can tell you this was not for children with disabilities. These were regular uh, children who had not had any special services needed, and they are severely lacking in their reading and math skills. So you I think, add, students, I think students with disabilities were included in that. Were they included in that? I did, uh, okay, so the study um, I saw, I'm not so sure it was, but there have been many, and what we see is that the level of the learning gap is different for different demographic groups. Mm -hmm. 
and is more severe for some groups than others. But all children, Lee, is your point, all children in some of these different studies were identified as having learning gaps. So, okay, so now we just have another um, issue on there. And I would also love that all of you did, and thank you so much, is continue to talk to us about the resources we do have and about the knowledge we do have and how we can use that knowledge to advocate for our children and to provide our services. So who here would like to raise your hand or unmute yourself, um, ask any questions you have, or um, feel free to share some of your thoughts. We'd like to hear from you. I do see there's a question in here from um, Mary Ann asking about, um, does the state of North Carolina offer IEP facilitation to help parents and school staff work collectively um, during difficult IEP conversations? I, I think yes. Uh, Michael, you probably can answer that better. I, I, I think there are facilitated IEPs that DPI yeah, I mean, there are provisions for that. I, there are provisions for that. What I would encourage you to do is to reach out to the uh, district's uh, EC director and ask about that. Um, but there are there are provisions for facilitation uh, um, under certain circumstances. Yes. Okay. Was there any other questions I missed in the chat? Oh, I said something about resources for kids that are turning eighteen. Did anybody have any suggestions or advice on that? Well, I I have that as uh, that is that is my most recent interest. So um, I I would. I think that is a future webinar. I have suggested that. I think I've suggested that to Yvonne. So I have two um, now, one with you and one with Angela. <laughs> Alicia, um, I don't know if you if you feel comfortable unmuting and um, if um, you know I in my district I, I work on a low incidence assessment team and that is something that we have talked about. Um, is what what are the resources? They graduate high school and then. Um, we wouldn't be involved with them, but um, we sort of pose to our group, what are the recreational opportunities? What are the leisure opportunities available for students um, with disabilities at all ages? And what are, what are the access, uh, what access do they have to, you know, you wanna take a trip to Europe? How do you take a trip to Europe? Um, I mean, that's a big, you know, that's a big dream trip, but what if you just wanted to go to the mountains? So, I don't want to get us too off task, but I don't have, you know, a, a set of resources for um, kids that are turning 18 or, or students who are maybe 22 and exiting the public school system. But if you have an interest in that, please, um, you know, st start looking at resources and questioning that. Also, I, I would also like to, recap. go ahead. I'm sorry, Michael. No, it's okay. I was just going to say, you can also reach out to your um, vocational rehabilitation um, counselors. They can help you with that because they're one of their main, one of the main things that they work on is, is supporting students and families during that transition out of high school um, into, you know, post high school life. So, um, you know, that is a whole separate service, but it, it's worth at least talking to them for sure. Um, there's another question here. Is there any information on the level of underreporting of populations, especially missing from this data, perhaps like native or indigenous communities? So are you, Michael, you could probably answer that. Maybe you can answer that one. I, are you talking about the, um, the report on learning loss, Olivia? Um, Yes, and also just the, the number of students with disabilities. So looking at, you know, the level of underreporting that might be happening or communities that are specifically not covered in the reporting. An idea of, of how many students we could potentially be missing um, in terms of those that have disabilities and then also the learning gaps. Um, Michael, do you, I, I would so, say I mean, deep. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. That's right. I was going to agree with you. Go ahead. Oh, DPI. I mean, I would say DPI would be um, the that would be who you would reach out to. Individual school systems wouldn't have that information. Michael, what do you what do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that's where. It, so the report was released to us by them. So that would be where I would start. 
is, is mm -hmm. asking questions with them. Um, and there may be some things individual school districts can assist with, and, uh, but the, that report was specific to an investigation that they did. Um, so I would, I would start there um, and then go from there. That's probably what I would do. I mean, that's what I would do if I had specific questions for myself mm -hmm. in my own um, job about that, that may have implications from that report. I would start there also. Okay, thank you. I wonder if there's anyone here who would like to share any uh, suggestions they may have for how to advocate for your child, for your for children in general in your school district, um, uh, with within your school. If anyone here has had any experience with that, I would like to share any advice for our uh, participants and especially those who may watch this later. There, we post this on YouTube after it's recorded. And we get hundreds and hundreds of hits later of people who couldn't make it tonight, but who will show up later. So I wonder if we have any other, anyone joining us has any advice for uh, folks in terms of advocacy work? Well, Susan. I can... Hi, welcome. Hi, don't give me an opening up on like that. <laughs> so hi, my name is Susan Book and I'm just going to plug right here, um, Every Child NC, um, which is a great way to advocate for Leandro on behalf of students with disabilities. Um, we have enormous resources out there on everychildnc.org, including a whole page on what um, our, our, our psychologist here talked about, but in kind of everyday language, um, straight from the consent order and the West Ed report. And we even have tables to show you how much your district would get in this category of students with disabilities. It's robust. We are, Every Child NC is always looking for more advocates um, for uh, parents and even kids with disabilities who are willing to tell their stories, step up. Um, we have awesome engagement opportunities all the time. And so they're just, just to know we are out there working on Leandro every day. Um, and if you want to be part of it, just step right up. We're ready for you. Thank you, Susan. And I do want to add that Susan um, and I both belong to um, uh, individual organizations that we work with and Every Child NC is a coalition of about 20 pretty powerful in terms of their passion and time and dedication, uh, advocacy groups. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's really a collaborative partnership that is really a, a, a lot of fun to work with because you're not just working in your own little area. Susan has a, a group that she works with. I work with Public Schools NC. Susan w works with Save Our Schools. Um, so with the, the, there's, a, there's a resources. If you go to that page, what's really, really, uh, really important is that, um, and I want to just share my screen really fast, really, really fast here because I think it's, so important. Um, if you can see my screen now, can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. And what Susan's talking about, mm -hmm. you can go in here and you can literally put in your school system. Like I'm going to pick Wake and then it will actually show me for Wake County. Okay, as you can see, what additional funding we would get in these different categories at risk. The first one is CTE teachers non-instructionals, at-risk students, disadvantaged students, um, all the way down. And, um, and it would sh actually show you the number of positions you'd have and what the impact could be in the budget dollars. This is an incredible, as Susan said, tool. And so I do hope that you will go and look at that because uh, a tremendous amount of work went in that. And sometimes, you know, my best tip for advocacy is Talk to somebody you know. Your legislator that you vote for is a good place to start. And you may, you know, being able to go to that legislator and say, look, here's what we could have for children with disabilities if you fund Leandro. Here's the number of te teacher assistants that we could add back in the classroom. I think this is kind of, kind of powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so Daniel, did you have a comment you wanted to share? Well, yes, first of all, good evening, everyone. 
Um, I am Mr. Grant King. It is good to see you, uh, Yvonne, again. I've met you before. <laughs> um, I just would like to say to each presenter, thank you. Um, because as an educator in the classroom, I also teach special education. Um, and at times when parents come to us, definitely at my school, I teach at a high school, and during those transition periods, we are always advised to recommend in those exit meetings that we have to have required by law to have a vocational rehab a part of that. And the main reason Wake County did that, I think a year or so ago, definitely during the pandemic was more so because families were trying to figure out certain resources. So I definitely advise every parent that has a child with special needs to get on the bandwagon early. And I say that because those, a lot of those resources sometimes are limited depending on what each county does across the state. And so, I mean, it's a phenomenal uh, work that you guys do. Um, and again, thank you. And um, I look forward um, to more advocacy in the future. And of course, I deal with more of that at the state level with the Department of um, Public Instruction currently. So, so again, thank you. And um, I want to add the same thing. Thank you, Daniel, and good to see you again too. One of the things that we should, should know is that um, there's, there's a, the whole issue of staff vac vacancies is a serious teacher pipeline issue. We're missing, you know, the areas that you can imagine, math, science, special education, are the areas hit the hardest in this broken teacher pipeline. We did a webinar last week. I hope you'll go and look on our YouTube channel and find that with the president and, uh, and the vice president of the North Carolina Association of Educators. And one of the things that we know is that we've got to pay our teachers better if we want to recruit them and keep them in the classroom. We also know that we've got to improve working condition conditions, and that includes not just things like benefits, but also the staffing in the building, like school psychologists to help them deal with issues of services to kids and families, social workers, nurses. So all of these things build the school climate. So I hope that as if you're interested in special education, that you will go into that field. It's very rewarding. But I also hope that you will understand and support the need for specialized support, what we call specialized instructional support, right? The school psychologists, the school counselors, the school social workers and the school nurses. These staffing um, requirements, it should be, you know, there are ratios that say there should be one for every 500 roughly, you know, ch children. And we should have one of these professionals in a school. So we have schools in our state that don't have a school psychologist, they don't have a school social worker. And if they have one, they're split between sometimes, you know, two schools or even three schools or they've absolutely had to contract out testing and there aren't any other services being provided. So we can do better than that in North Carolina. That's what we believe at Public Schools First. We believe that we have the surplus budget this year, that we have the funding available. We have a roadmap that Lee talked to you about, Leandro, the West Ed Report. Um, and so now we just need to connect those dots and talk about having the schools our children deserve. And what more deserving and underfunded uh, population in our school than students with disabilities? There, um, the, uh, the funding for students with disabilities is woefully underfunded at the federal level and the state level. So um, I hope that you learned something tonight. And I hope you will become an advocate for um, improving services in our school buildings and, and looking for ways to advocate to make sure that children with disabilities have the educational experience they deserve and need. Um, I wonder any more questions, any more comments? I don't want to give, you know, we've got about a few more minutes here. Anybody else would like to share? I think there was one more question in here. 
Okay, um, I didn't see it. What was it? It's uh, uh, from Marianne Lachlan. I know she's she is asking uh, about um, that some other states were considering allowing students with disabilities an additional two years of schooling doing due to the pandemic or legislatively extending the time period for state complaints or due process. I have I really I have no information in that area. I, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, and I would I would just point you to back to DPI because I think that would be, um, those would be the people that would have that information. Um, and I would everybody's you, asking great questions. because I know, and I would say, I would point you straight, Marianne, to your legislator, because I think this is a wonderful, a wonderful suggestion. Um, and uh, and I, you know, the question also was, what is DPI? Department of Public Instruction. Okay. So, that was a question. Okay, so I would really say that that with a clever idea like this, though, it might be really wonderful to talk with someone who's a strong advocate for special education services and students at the General Assembly and asked, you know, have you thought about this? Would you consider it? Because it would have to be a state statute. There'd have to be a change in the General Assembly to allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. um, DPI is the North, uh, that, that's some of those letters we throw around, Department of Public Instruction the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And with, with that, that department has an elected superintendent and they are charged with providing lots and lots of resources and support services to all the school districts. They handle licensing and they also handle working on setting up the curriculum standards and those kind of things. Lots of stuff they do, but uh, we do look for them to collect the data and we do look them for them for training and guidance. So it's a great place to go. Uh, but also some of these, the best suggestions that you might have are worth sharing. If you're a parent of a child with disabilities, you have a strong voice. You have the strongest voice in the room if you share it, because you have something that nobody else has. You have a personal story uh, of, uh, of, of, about a child. And that is a powerful um, way to, to impact decisions that are made, telling real stories about real needs and, and real problems that exist within the school system. Um, anybody else? Anything else? Um, so Lee and Angela and Michael, thank you not only for coming tonight, but thank you for your dedication, your professionalism. I think if anybody could um, talk to any of you for very long, they'd want to go and sign up for uh, to help out and to, and to join your ranks and maybe become a school psychologist and certainly think about ways they could join one of those advocacy groups you mentioned, Lee. Um, there's a whole bunch of them on that screen that a lot of those groups really need um, help. And um, it would be nice to, to, to do that. The last thing I'll say to you in closing um, tonight is, you know, connect with us at Public Schools First. We would, uh, we would invite you to do that. We have, um, you, know, you know, all those things they say, which people half my age, um, like us, tweet us, you know, <laughs> follow us, uh, whatever those things are, we'd appreciate you doing it. And go to our website too, Public Schools First NC, join our newsletter, and look at all our resources. Anything on our website is yours to download, to reprint, to use. It's free. Our goal is to educate parents and um, in ways that they can become engaged in their advocacy work. So thank you all so very, very much for coming tonight. And I really hope that you've learned something tonight. I hope that you've gotten some new names of people that you can um, um, hopefully, you know, see as resources because all of these folks here tonight would so gladly talk to you and help you in any way. So look for this recording. And when you see it on YouTube, share it with a lot of your friends. Um, and if the presenters would stay on just for a minute, but the rest of you, good night. Thank you for coming, and I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you all. Uh, also